I appreciate the great intro. Um, it's, it's funny. You always uh, think about how, you know, you've known these friends or scientists for a long time and then you hear them like recite how long they've known you. And you're like, Oh God. Yeah. That was a long, <laughs> when Britton and I first met, I had uh, hair down to here and we were sitting next to each other in the bioinformatics class. And I don't know. I, I think he's like, you like metal. And I was like, yeah, I like metal. And then we were like, we're friends. Let's live together. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, actually it was also at my wedding. So I was one, you missed that one. Brent. That's right. That's right. Uh, all right, cool. We can still be friends. Um, okay. So I'm going to <laughs> share my screen with you guys. And okay. So today I'm going to talk to you guys about um, a bunch of different topics. So my goal here is for you to kind of um, come away with an understanding, oops, of how to work PowerPoint, um, of these trophic interactions and the symbioses that are important in tropical ecosystems and how some work that I've been a part of uh, has addressed some of these questions about how do you restore ecosystems if they've been disturbed and what are maybe the long-term consequences of what might be a, a good short-term action, but does it have a long-term impact? So the two systems I'm gonna talk about are ones that I've worked pretty intimately with, uh, which are tropical coral reefs and the uh, tropical montane forests. These are you know, mountain forest ecosystems. So they're you know, relatively high up, higher altitude, um, you know, on the sides of mountains that we have here in, in Hawaii. And so in both of these images, you know, you see uh, the ecosystem engineers, which are the, the corals, and you have these, these trees, right? So both of these uh, habitats are structured by these primary producers, although they're very different, one being an animal and one being obviously a plant. And so well, first I'll talk about coral reefs. Um, so coral reefs we know are very important. They're important because of the cultural significance. They're important because of the biodiversity they, they house and the services that they provide. And we know that they're threatened by climate change. Now, this figure on the right here is just showing um, coral bleaching uh, hot spots, you know, or areas of the ocean was warming uh, in 2015. And so these are areas where you might see coral bleaching occur, which is that breakdown, that symbiosis between coral and their uh, intercellular algae. And so this change of climate, change of ocean temperature, change of ocean pH um, is also juxtaposed across these local impacts that vary across different places in the world where there can be a range of habitat uh, affecting effects, you know, such as pollution, um, you know, overfishing, uh, damage by non uh, or well-intentioned tourists and things like this. But all these together really threaten coral reefs because they threaten the primary producers, those that structure the habitat, which are these reef corals. And you know, just to remind you what a coral is, you know, I know you guys are temperate, but hopefully you, know, you understand that corals are animals. They have a symbiosis with intercellular algae that live in their tissues and these algae provide them with their energy and their nutrition, right? So if, if you think about a, a coral reef, one thing that's really important uh, is the nutrient cycling. The water is actually relatively poor in nutrients. So they have evolved, corals and many other animals have evolved to have these symbioses with these algae, just, you know, collectively called symbiodiniaceae or previously known as uh, the zooxanthellae. And so these are really important um, interactions here, these species interactions that, you know, really structure the food webs of coral reefs. And it's not just because the corals get this energy from their symbionts, but they excrete tons of mucus and that mucus then forms the foundation of the microbial loop more or less. And that is how, you know, other organisms can, uh, can feed from the bottom up. They are taking this energy that's coming from these corals in different ways. And so what corals really appreciate or they are, you know, excel in environments that uh, have decently high light, not too high, you know, but they're bright, the water's clear and doesn't have a lot of nutrients in it. So if we think about human impacts, obviously one thing we think about is how waters become more turbid, they get pollution filled, the nutrients, nitrogen, and phosphorus go up and that perturbs the symbiosis and it perturbs the environments really. And when we think about climate change and this, these corals here, they're all appearing white, this is you know, coral bleaching, right? So this is when those uh, symbionts get expelled from the coral tissue and ultimately the corals can starve and die. Um, we always think about this as a context of, you know, ocean warming, but, you know, bleaching is a physiological response that can happen due to many different factors. It can happen due to changes in temperature, changes in light, changes in, um, in uh, 
other chemical parameters in seawater, pollution, things like that. Um, so this is a, you know, when you see corals that are bleached, they're not happy, they're not healthy. And if they die, then you're thinking about it in a way of like cutting down trees in a forest. It takes a long time for them to grow. Their services take a long time to come to fruition. And um, they're the components that really provide that structure of these ecosystems. And because of the close proximity for corals and, you know, humans, uh, their most coastal cities um, that are in the United States, at least, you know, they don't have coral reefs, but, you know, down in uh, Miami, uh, there's uh, obviously healthy coral reefs that are impacted by local impacts due to the city of Miami. Same here in Hawaii, right? We have a lot of people on the island of Oahu where Honolulu is. And so all these impacts that are uh, related just to in the United States, you know, you think about going to other countries, third world countries, and you have um, like high centers of biodiversity in the Indo-Pacific and you have lots of large cities there too. And so these, these uh, conflicting um, interests of, you know, economic and human development, coastal development with biodiversity are something that we're always trying to, to mitigate. We're always trying to work on ways to make these interactions um, less harmful for biodiversity. And, you know, some of those impacts by being close to corals, really, you know, having cities that are built literally next to or on coral reefs, is that it can lead to pollution, it can lead to sedimentation, uh, uh, channelization of, of, of ditches and streams, you know, putting concrete in areas, increasing flow, increasing erosion, all those things can have harmful impacts on corals. Uh, and also that there comes the with, with big ports and large cities, you have the opportunity for invasive species to be transported between ports through ballast water or just introduction for industry, things like this. But ultimately, the, you know, one of the main problems with uh, those com competitive forces in corals is that they compete with other fast growing organisms like algae. Uh, this is like macroalgae, right? So if nutrients are high, those macroalgae can produce a lot of biomass very quickly and they can smother corals like this photo here on the right hand side bottom. Uh, you can see this is actually a coral reef, but it's completely covered in macroalgae. Uh, and this is an invasive species that was recently found in Hawaii that was doing this. And so while we just talked all about, you know, coral reefs and all the things that, that they provide and their foundational species, um, those problems that I just mentioned, whether it's pollution or disease, habitat loss, prevalence of invasive species, that's something that is true, Malka to Makai is a Hawaiian way of saying it. So it's, it's true both in, on the mountain side and on the ocean side. And so these same factors that are uh, affecting ecosystems by the shore are affecting those ecosystems uh, up further on the mountain or up in uh, the hills, right? And so in places like Hawaii, you know, Hawaii is a center for uh, biodiversity and it's also high in endemism. So those species that are found nowhere else on earth. And that may be these endangered Hawaiian birds like the EV bird, the honey creeper right here, uh, or maybe the, the ohia tree, uh, which is a, a native Hawaiian species. Um, and these, these are species that are really now only found in high alpine areas because they've been more or less extirpated or pushed out from the low-lying areas because of human development, all those things I mentioned, invasive species and the like. And so if you were in Hawaii and you're going around taking pictures, you're walking through Waikiki, it's so beautiful, there's flowers everywhere, beautiful trees, beautiful birds. Almost none of those species you see will be uh, native species. And you actually have to go quite far into the, the, to the, uh, like the ridges and the trails and the mountains to find these species. And in some islands, you may not find uh, much or any of them. So when we talk about conserving biodiversity, you know, we might think of the um, the importance of conserving the birds or conserving the corals because they're maybe pretty to us. But those species that are really important, like the trees, uh, the native species that are providing the habitat for all of these uh, species that we find pleasurable to look at or enjoy their services, um, those are the ones that we really have to think about. The engineers of these habitats and how we can try to rebuild habitats that are, are being uh, decimated by uh, climate change, but also human impacts. Those forest habitats are often uh, influenced by agriculture. They're influenced by, um, like here in Hawaii especially, uh, for a long time, Hawaii was growing and exporting pineapples and sugarcane. It's not so much anymore because the uh, economics don't really add up to have it make, make sense to do that here. We can get it from South America. But uh, that, those impacts for like from the 1800s on are, are persistent. So these ecosystems have been changed in ways that we aren't fully understanding and they've been changed for centuries. 
Uh, and then with the introduction of livestock, which are also not native to Hawaii, obviously, you have these pressures of the plants and the animals that are introduced, they're changing ecosystems in ways that make it even harder to potentially go back to what ecosystems used to be, or to even facilitate a middle ground where you could still have some species that are native or get the same services that might be provided by slightly different forests. So one big question in restoration ecology in general is really how can we restore tropical ecosystems and maybe more importantly, not just make them look like the, their remnant or their native counterparts, but how can we really reverse those legacies of abuse? And that may mean that it's not just, you know, putting the coral back on the reef or putting the trees back in the forest, but it's the, you know, the environmental, the biological legacies that will persist for long periods of time and take a lot of effort and maybe decades to reverse it to truly change. So in this case, you know, some things I'll be focusing on for this talk, at least, are the invasive macroalgae and uh, forests that were taken over for grasses, uh, deforested more or less, and planted for grasses for, for livestock in Hawaii. So the first part, we'll go back and we'll talk about coral reefs. And so this is a study that I was a part of on the island of Oahu, which is right here in the Hawaiian island chain. And this is involving corals in Kaneohe Bay, which you might have heard of from your intro bio class. It's always an example that's brought up about uh, you know, macroalgae smothering coral reefs. And this is the macroalgae through here, smothering these uh, corals that are throughout the bay. And this is one of the, uh, the main drivers here. This is Gorilla Ogo, but as it's called. Uh, and it's uh, an invasive macroalgal species. And you can actually see the uh, little foreshadowing here of maybe the solution to the problem is this collector urchin, which likes to eat it actually. So then the second part of the talk, uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, forests on Big Island, which is uh, um, an area that's on the eastern flank of Mauna Kea and uh, how they've been restoring tropical forests there by the planting of acacia koa trees. And so if you're a surfer, maybe you've heard of koa because the first surfboards were made of koa. So. Um, now let's think about coral reefs. So coral reefs, very beautiful. This is a, an overhead drone shop, Kaneohe Bay. And this is facing the ocean, right? So you look at this and everyone just sighs relief. Ah, it's so beautiful. It's so pretty. It's untouched. It's pristine. This is a postcard, right? And you, you look at this and yeah, of course, all those things are true. It's really, really beautiful. Um, and it goes out to the ocean, deeper waters outside the bay, nice and clean and pulls all that nutrients inside of the bay. And there's decent fish habitat here and really high coral cover, which you can kind of see these little patch reefs through here. So these are all little like coral reef islands. Um, they kind of go off to like deeper channels along the outside of it. Anyway, very beautiful. I was really fortunate to do my PhD work here. Um, but if you turn that camera around and look to the other way, you'd see this. Obviously with a little less Photoshop and maybe a different Instagram filter. But this is what is the reality of coral reefs, right? Coral reefs are not usually these, let's go back again, beautiful, blue, pristine, untouched areas. It's very common that they are right next to human impacts that are usually literally at their back door. Um, and so what we see here is we see a very large urban development. We see, you know, this is uh, uh, one of the highways that crosses through the island actually goes through the mountains right here. And this is, you know, a really large metropolitan area. And what we also might think when we look at this is, man, I wonder where all their sewage goes. Well, for a long time, the sewage from this entire area was pumping right out into the bay right here. And it was, you know, they thought that it would be flushed out as we saw from that previous photo where maybe the water would pull that pollution and sewage out the bay to the ocean. But they didn't pay any scientists to come up with that conclusion. And so they... Uh, they actually just kind of hoped it would work. And of course it didn't. And it made a giant eddy in the back of the bay where all that sewage and nutrients never really escaped. And so it caused massive algal blooms. And when you read you know, these examples of talking about Kaneohe Bay and invasive macroalgae and all that nutrient pollution, they always talk about this case as like sewage outfalls inside an embayment causing algal blooms, phase shifts on coral reefs. But luckily in the seventies, they, they you know, did a study and found out that obviously that was stupid. And they then took the pipe and moved it far out to sea. And so, you know, now it's not a problem for the, at least the coral reefs nearby. So the reefs have had a chance to recover and recover they have. Most of the reefs um, are really low in macroalgae biomass. There are tons of corals there, but 
that legacy of having all that sewage pumped into the bay led to these conditions where you have lots of invasive macroalgae that were allowed to take hold. And, you know, the general problem, you know, in areas like this is that if you have urbanization and you have this nutrient pollution coming into an area that's generally nutrient poor, this gives those footholds for species to, to, you know, explode or to exploit. In this case, this is an invasive macroalgae was able to exploit those conditions quite well. And because of all these people and a high fishing pressure, you actually had relatively low herbivores in the first place. So the natural systems that were in place to help, you know, a coral reef you deal with these uh, problems with an invasive species, you know, like macroalgae, such as like herbivores would be a good way to get rid of them. They were really low. So without the herbivores, again, it made this case where these algae could explode. And ultimately this led to, to, to declines in coral cover, which, you know, we're a little bit beyond now, but the, the initial problems uh, were severe. And so there were some drastic measures that were taken that I'll, we'll talk about today. So this is what the reefs looked like during those times when we had more nutrient pollution or we had uh, all these invasive algae that were still present on the reef. Um, you can kind of see that these are smothering algae. And so a lot of the cases, the coral below can survive, but if they stay there and they smother the coral, then of course it dies. And so this isn't just a problem about uh, you know having algae on top of coral reefs and that's bad because they don't look pretty. It's actually causing the reefs to, below them to die. Uh, and so ultimately, you know, how do we get rid of macroalgae? Well, you might say, well, we got to we got to eat it off or we got to pull it off or we have to treat it with some chemical or something. Or maybe if we just turned off the spigot of the nitrogen and phosphorus, it would all go away. Well, they turned off the spigot and they all stayed around. So that wasn't going to do it. So they tried the bottom up approach. Just get rid of the nutrients and the algae will follow. Well, that, there was still enough of the algae to exploit. Okay, well, uh, what about the herbivores? Well, we didn't have enough herbivores around to do the job for us. Okay, well, what about pulling it off? Well, that could take, you know, this all breaks apart in fragments. And so you could, by shredding it, you, you just make more propagules. Um, and what about chemical treatments? Uh, a lot of times when people say, well, we're gonna get rid of an invasive allergy, they'll say, well, if it's like an inland area, you say, well, just drain the lake or we'll salt it to death or we'll add boiling water or a chemical or uh, we'll use acid. And these are actually real approaches that have been documented on how to get rid of uh, invasive macroalgae. But you can imagine all those things don't sound like they would work really well on a coral reef, a sensitive ecological area. So the, the state um, got creative with a way to actually address this. And so what they did was, you know, there's, these are these different consortia of, of, um, of different invasive algae that are problematic. And they did studies to see you know, which ones uh, were most common in different areas across uh, Hawaii. And most all these have been introduced from very various reasons from macroculture um, to just accidental ballast water exchanges. Um, and the biggest one that was found in Kaneohe was this one, Kapaphycus eukema, which is a type of red algae, but it's, it's very uh, common used in mariculture, which is actually where it might've come from. They think a scientist probably brought it in to do some work on it at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, which is inside Kaneohe Bay. But then uh, it got out after they found out that it wasn't probably gonna work well for their needs for mariculture. This is back in the fifties. Uh, and so it got out and then it got a foothold and then the nutrients and so explosion, right? Um, and the reason why you see these products up here is in case you don't know, um, you know macroalgae are in these products. Uh, so uh, munch up, I suppose. But the, the problem for them is how do we get rid of these macroalgae now? Uh, and so the, the mechanism that they decided to, to test in the field, which is what I was a part of, uh, at least part of the data analysis for it, was this combination of mechanical removal and biocontrol. And what was really, I think, very novel about this was they took this, these approaches of you know, basically like we just already did, did a thought experiment about what could we do? How could we actually get rid of it? And they thought, well, if we can do some short-term experiments and see if this works at small scales where you scale up. And they did some small experiments about caging off an area, removing the algae, seeing what the algae would come back. And they put some that they would just put urchins on the reef. And then they would do others where they did both together. And they found the, com the combination of the two actually was the most effective. And you know, one thing I want to emphasize here is that you're probably thinking, oh my God, they're just going to put a bunch of these urchins on the reef. But these are actually native urchins. So they they thought about all those problems that we just discussed about how they, you know, what happens if we remove the algae, but it breaks apart. We'll use a vacuum to just suck it all up. So that's actually a vacuum the person's using in their hand right there. And they said, well, what about the, or the bio, uh, the uh, biocontrollers or what, you know, the herbivores, which, what could we do in this case? Well, if we 
were able to grow a bunch of them and then put them onto the reef, they would be a great uh, predator to help suck up all this, uh, uh, the, the macroalgae, and then that would eventually make the reefs look better. So great hypothesis, I wonder if it worked. And what's really cool about it is that they did a massive effort here, you know, um, went across 40 hectares of coral reef habitat and with a giant team and uh, a barge, this is a floating barge here that just has like a big vacuum that runs out to the reef. And there's people in the water that you can kind of see one of them going around here, uh, just basically picking off the reef, picking all the algae off the reef that they see, putting it into this hose that then gets sucked back up to the barge. There's people on the barge that then go through and you know sort out the, the invasive species from the native species. And then they see there's any invertebrates, they put those back. And it's not like this is going into like a blender, right? It's just, it's just a pressure hose. It's what's just sucking up and spitting things out. And so this is a way they can sort it, pick it and go through. And as you can see, this person more or less just cleaned up this entire section of reef and got out, you know, huge amounts of biomass uh, of the in invasive algae. Now, of course, the problem is that, you know, maybe they didn't get all of it. So that's when the, the uh, biocontrollers come in. That's why they're so important. And, uh, on the back end of that, all that algae, where does it go? Well, they worked with local farmers that were going to take that algae and go compost it and then, you know, use it in the kalo fields over here, like where they grow taro. So it was a full circle approach. It was, you know, removing it from the reef, but then actually doing something with it and helping local communities. So it really helped to build this, um, this larger partnership between scientists, managers, and the community to do something to help the reef, right? So it's, it was this, you know, it takes a village kind of approach. And the, the biocontrol agent that they used was, again, these native species of urchins, the Trypneustis scrotilla, which is a native Hawaiian species, those collector urchins. So like the original photo I showed, you had some algae stuck to its back. It crawls across the reef. It's really slow, so it has low vigility, doesn't move very far. Uh, it likes the invasive algae. They did tests to see what kind of algae it liked, and it really liked the invasive species. Uh, they were able to culture it in large quantities and were able to get over 280,000 urch urchins cultured and then put those out on the reef, which is a lot of time. Uh, but they were able to, you know, these little guys can crawl into all the little crevices in the reef and eat the little algae inside there. And, you know, they're natural hunters for, for algae. So uh, it was a really fantastic experiment. And, you know, they would take these guys and put them out in the reef after they've been cultured long enough. And, you know, they, these little bins here full of urchins and after three or five months, put them on the reef and you can see them all out here just doing the work, going around, just chomping away at all the uh, macroalgae that was left behind by the divers. So this, you know, kind of was a great, you know, urchin farming, um, the, the Division of Aquatic Resources, kind of like the Fish and Wildlife out here, they like to call it, you know, a bunch of sea goats, you know, so it was like, you know, putting a bunch of goats on the reef to just go and eat all the, the invasive algae. And what they found was, that the urchins didn't really have a negative impact on anything that was native. Like it didn't really hurt coral recruits. It didn't really seem to bother um, you know, native species. So there was a lot of you know, concern about that at first, but again, using native species that are found in the area and they can then go back and pick them up and then move them somewhere else afterwards. They're not necessarily staying there for their entire existence, right? So this was a really cool approach to you know, use these, uh, these biocontrol herbivores to control a macroalgae problem. And this is some data from our, from our paper that came out uh, in 2013, I think. But it was, uh, you know, kind of seeing what were those effects if we went across time and just assess the community. And so you can see on the control reefs here, these are different groups of uh, invasive species, right? So these are the Euchema and Capophycus, the orange and the yellow, which are really the big problems. Um, and also the Gracilaria silicornia, which is the Gorilla Ogo I mentioned. And uh, anyway, so the, these species were in really high abundance relatively on cover for the control reefs, you know, 15, 20% of the cover. Uh, but then on the treatment reefs where they went out and they put these urchins and they did all their, their work uh, through the super sucker, as it's called, you saw a steady decline over time where all these were going down by over 95% uh, through time, which is a really fantastic thing that this was able to be sustained uh, through time. Now, of course, the long-term implications of that are not necessarily clear. Uh, you know, what could the urchins do this for? Like, how long could they do this work? Could they be left in the field? Could they recruit naturally and then keep the, the algae at bay? Or is it something that's only a short-term effect? A long-term monitoring is needed to really address that question. But the fact that they were able to show that this worked is pretty phenomenal. And what was really interesting is that because they were monitoring this through time, this is another figure here on the left side, just showing you the change that percent cover 
across those reefs. Here's that treatment reef and here's the control reef. You start seeing this decline on the control reefs too. And so they were really interested to say, well, why is it, why does it appear that the control reefs didn't keep going up, they started going down? Like what might've happened? And so they did another study to kind of uh, flush that out a little bit. And what they found was that this is percent cover of algae here. It's kind of, you know, really high and it's sort of starts to trend down over time. And then it's been really low on control reefs afterwards. These are reefs that have not been touched necessarily by, uh, by their super sucker mitigation efforts. And they found that it was actually that there was a large increase in herbivore biomass, specifically they think uh, with green sea turtles, which have been growing in populations here and almost have been taken off the endangered species list. Um, and that's because these turtles are found very often in Kanye Bay. They're actually kind of a, almost a, a nuisance. You, can, you know, trying, trying not to hit them with a the boat is harder than you'd think. But, you know, they're, they're on the rise and because they've been protected. So now we have these, this protection of herbivores we have more fish biomass and more, you know, sea turtle biomass in the reefs, and they're actually able to chomp and eat much more than these urchins are. So while they were able to show there's a way that managers could get creative and make this change happen in a positive way, it was also that long-term change in how they were protecting more charismatic megafauna, perhaps, uh, was also affecting reefs that were not being worked on. So it's this interesting approach about how herbivory in general is very important in controlling these factors, those top-down approaches, as we know, but also doing, doing management to try to address these problems so that, you know, maybe you can push things forward uh, in short-term goals with long-term management implications. So just kind of taking away the, the, the messages from this section, uh, you know, these aggressive and creative management uh, solutions can really help improve coral reefs and you know, if we address the problem, the bottom up and top down, in this case, you know, the protecting herbivores and mitigating nutrient pollution that together can help solve these problems. Um, and then using maybe the trophic interactions that are really important to regulate these, you know, problematic species like macroalgae can be really important for coral reefs in general. Now, as we kind of part away from that for a second, um, I want to, you know, let's just kind of think about the scale of what I just talked about, right? We talked about putting out a ton of urchins in a relatively small area. It showed to be, uh, you know, a, a solution that could, you know, help with the coral reef uh, condition, you know, helping them with removing these macroalgae and helping the reefs in that area. But you can imagine scaling that up would be quite hard. And then if you said, I want you to do that for 30 years, it might even be, be much harder. Um, and so there's a feasibility and what we can do in certain systems and also how we can monitor them, monitor them through time. And sometimes the things we do on coral reefs are a lot of set and then walk away. Like we're gonna protect it and walk away or we're gonna stop the nutrient pollution and walk away. And it can take a long time to, to see those impacts sort of uh, come up, come to fruition. Up on, you know, in, in mountain ecosystems, they may have the same problems like I had just said, but what is, interesting in that case is that the approach is often very similar, you know, how do we, you know, if, if, a, if a forest has been burned down, just put the trees out and you now you have a forest again, or if the wetland is gone, you just, you know, get an area of land and flood it and now it's a wetland. That's not necessarily the case. So the whole, like, if you build it, they will come is not necessarily true. And we see that approach kind of taking hold uh, in coral reefs as well. Like if we want to restore a coral reef, just put some more corals there. Well, that's not going to really restore the reef. It might put corals there, but the corals themselves may not do well in this area unless you address some of those underlying problems. Um, and so in, in, you know, the forest ecosystems of Hawaii, one thing they've, they've thought about doing is this kind of, if you build it, they will come approach. And that comes to, you know, replacing those endemic species that were found that structure those ecosystems. So if we thought about, you know, coral reefs and these tropical forests, I know that they're, they're kind of different, right? But if we think about the difference of saying, if we took a coral reef and there were no coral, how would we make a coral reef again? And that may not be something that sounds that far-fetched with how coral reefs are being treated these days. But, you know, with, we're thinking about the same sort of scenario here about, um, you know, cre recreating forest communities in areas where there are literally no forest trees anymore. They, you know, they're grasslands. Now they've been grasslands for hundreds of years now. So how do you make a forest in an area that's been a grassland for two centuries? Well, at least, you know, again, the main approach has been replant or repopulate an area with species that were found there that are native that we know should be there and that should help at least by setting the foundation 
for those, you know, the ecosystem services, the habitat engineers, those will start by putting the primary producers that belong there back. And in the case of Hawaii, the acacia koa tree, it's, it's very important to recognize this tree is actually a nitrogen fixer. So it, uh, it has a symbiosis with nitrogen fixing bacteria that live in the soil. And those are really important for, uh, you know, nitrogen and nutrient cycling in the soils. So we'll come back to that. And so what have they done in these mountain forests to try and, you know, restore them to their, their uh, previous um, states? Well, they've been influenced since the 1800s by being converted to pasture lands and farmlands. And they, what they did was they took areas of the forest and they, these are areas that were more or less remnant. The, the cows never grazed to, you can see kind of patchy. But you see here these long strings. And these are actually giant corridors where koa have been planted since the 1980s. And you can see that they've done quite well. This is the same photo taken from 1993. And you can see the grasslands kind of throughout here, really few trees. And you can see here in 2007, these are all koa trees planted throughout this area. So they've done a great job at reforesting. And it's a considerable amount of land. I mean, 300,000 koa, right? They're a little bit larger than those nearly 300,000 urchins that we talked about. But these koa have helped to re-engineer those systems. But again, at, at what what sort of impact might have might might this have on the system as we've changed it from a native forest to a grassland and now we're back to not really a native forest but a forest dominated by a single native species and these are this is a photo of these these corridors here you can see there's still grasslands on either side and the koa are running down through it sometimes they're patchy you can almost imagine someone planting 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 through here um, but what's interesting i like you to kind of think about here is that this is not normally how forests look we don't have these giant you know, segments of grasses that have trees running through them. So this is sort of a, it's already kind of looks unnatural, but it's, this was their approach. We build corridors, eventually they'll kind of bridge across and these corridors will merge and then you'll have a forest. And so one important thing to think about here is that forests are not just the trees above ground, but they're also the roots below ground, the chemistry of the soil, the symbiotic interactions that, that forests, uh, the trees and grasses have with uh, with you know bacteria and fungi that are found in the soil and so one really important one is these mycorrhizal fungi which are you know, fungi that associate with plant roots and they're really important in taking up nutrients and they're important in establishing uh the plants that maybe you want versus the ones that you don't inside of a forest they're really important in the succession and the growth of forest ecosystems and you know they're just like the uh the symbiosis with the corals and the dinoflagellates it's you know based on nutritional exchanges in this case the uh you know, the, the sugars that go from plant to the fungi are, are given in exchange for the nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus that come from the fungi. So this is, again, that way to get those essential nutrients, um, which are limited and also hard to find uh, in the soil. So the mycorrhizae help to extend that reach. So really important in nutrient acquisition. And so when we think about these, uh, these different forests and the symbiosis they may have and, you know, how different forest canopies may differ from each other, um, one great way is to look at these two different native species that are common in Hawaii. Most of the canopies here in Hawaii are found to be dominated by these two species, koa, which we've talked about a little bit, and ohia, which is this species right here. And so one thing that's really important here is that because koa is a nitrogen fixer and ohia is not, there's some really important distinctions. For instance, that koa has really high nitrogen in its leaves, produces a lot of litter, that litter breaks down faster and it increases the soil nitrogen and overall decreases soil organic matter because of just increased respiration of the soil. And what's really interesting is that when we look at the understory of these two forests, we see that under the ohia side where it has lower nitrogen, you see that there's less of these exotic grasses like this. And these are like uh, kikuyu grass, which is an, uh, an exotic species here in Hawaii. But it forms really thick mats. In some cases, you're walking through the forest and it could be three feet thick mat of grass. So if you thought, well, how would a native plant be able to establish here? That's a good question. How could a native plant somehow make it to the soil and then grow through three feet of grass before it gets to the surface where it can see the sun? So when we think about, again, building the canopy, building the forest, it depends on which type of forest you're building. Are you building a koa forest or are you building an ohia forest? And most of them in Hawaii are that mixture. So if you don't have the mixture, then you're already making a forest that may not be the same representation of a native forest. And so some of those considerations of you know, using a nitrogen fixer, this one that's symbiotic with um, these nitrogen fixing bacteria, some positives are that because you have more nitrogen available and you have higher production of biomass, 
that's good for the ecosystem. That is, you know, creating better primary production. It's sucking out more CO2. It's actually a really important step in being a, a carbon storage system. Um, and as a community that could speed this, uh, speed this succession and the primary growth of the forests. And for the organism, it's more nitrogen, more biomass, more growth, get bigger, faster, right? So it's kind of like the, you know, the, um, the steroid driven forest analogy with, with nitrogen, right? You're, you're gaining this fertilizer that can facilitate an ecosystem in a positive direction. However, on the neutral or negative side of that, it really, you know, this, this function of nitrogen fixers is also really dependent on the latitude that they're found. They're not all the same in tropics versus in temperate forests. It's dependent on the amount of phosphorus in the soil because the ability to fix nitrogen is dependent on having phosphorus present as well, but not too much. It can facilitate, you know, a forest to change, but it can also facilitate a competitive interaction because nitrogen fixers can be selfish. They can keep that energy for themselves and not share it to the other members, thereby creating these forests that are maybe dominated by nitrogen fixing species that are working selfishly. And it's also really energetically costly. So there's energetic cost that has to be met somewhere. So, you know, in, in thinking about all of these, again, there, in, in any effort that you would want to undertake with restoration or conservation, there may be consequences for actions that are unforeseen. So you have to kind of think about not just how it's working for one species or one goal, but what's the long-term picture here and what might happen through time. And so, you know, after 50 years, so they started planning these, um, you know, in the, the 1970s uh, like and 80s, uh, you're looking at almost 50 years of restoration. So what, what have they created this, you know, as, as I said, free Eden or Franken Eden? And you know, are they making a forest that's actually going to support the services that they set out? They're going to rebuild the forest, rebuild the habitat. And, you know, they have at least shown that they've, you know, recreated these forest habitats for endemic birds. Birds are more common. Pollinators for these plants are there. But they're, the native species that should recruit to the understories are actually still in quite low abundance. And the dominant species in the understory are still those exotic grasses. So the question that some work that I've been involved with has sort of asked is, are these changes that we're seeing, are the, like the dominance of exotic grasses, is this due to these nitrogen fixing plants, due to the actions of restoration or the legacy of disturbance that's happened over the last hundred years or more? And so this might have led to these, this case of a stalled secession. And it might be that the restoration itself is incomplete, or it could be that there's some, some below ground cause that's preventing this ecosystem to change in a way that uh, maybe would facilitate the services that we would like to see, which is truly to rebuild a native ecosystem again. So two research questions that I'll talk to you about, I'll try to make these, I'm basically taking like my entire postdoc now and just like squishing it together uh, in like 10 minutes. Uh, but these are two questions that I think we can, we can address with some, you know, interest. And the, you know, the first part here is, are these communities that are found in the soils, those are these symbiotic communities, the mycorrhizal fungi, are there, is there any evidence they might be affected by land use and restoration? You know, do we see that the remnant forests that were never touched are really different from those that are the restored forest? Are they really similar? You know, what can we know about these pools of symbionts that are really important that can tell us about forest change? And so to do that, we'll talk a little bit briefly about uh, some network analysis that I did. And then the second part of this is looking at the nitrogen fixation in these forests to see if there's some sort of pattern that might suggest there's some uh, facilitation of invasive grasses, which um, I use some stable isotopes to address. But uh, the first part of this talking about the, the network, uh, microbial networks, this is something I, I had not been introduced to prior to my postdoc, but I think it's really interesting. And so this is stuff that comes from like social media and game theory and all those sort of things. You know, Facebook does this every time you click on a post there, you know, it's data that's collecting you as a species or as an individual and how you are connected to other things in a larger network. Why do you think it's called the social network, right? So in each one of these cases in this, you know, modified really simple network here, these are all species or they could be individuals if you're Facebook. Um, and these are all connected in some way by these, um, these lines. And so these edges that connect the network can tell us about, you know, for example, you know, these different species are connected in different ways to one another. You know, this number six over here is not connected very well, but number, you know, one and five and two, these are you know, highly connected. So th that means that these have a different role potentially in a network. They could be, they're facilitating interactions. They're bridging, you know, without five, you know, one and four are very rarely connected, but five helps to bridge that and bring them together. 
So this is really simple. Uh, but now let's think about it being really big and you start asking yourself, wow, like what is, what does this mean? And, and, and how are all these interactions working and what might those interactions be? Well, in this case, again, every circle is a species and these are just species, or in this case, let's say like mycorrhizal fungi, or maybe for simple case, we could just say everyone like in this class or, you know, in, in Southern California, right? This is a, a group of people or an individual, some sort of category, and they're connected in some way to other species, other individuals, other categories throughout a network. And those that have a really high connection, those that have this, what they call a high between us centrality, mean that they're connected really, really well. So that means that th like this node here, this species, individual, whatever, is connected a lot with others nearby. And so it has a lot of the uh, a lot of connections and it doesn't mean that it's present all the time doing in high abundance but it means that if a network is around you might find this one there and that can tell us something because this is taken from um, you know text but it just says that you know like a node in a network that has high connectivity can have high control over that network because if you drop out this node all of a sudden many of these can no longer be connected to each other and it breaks down the network it's a big game of telephone and you take out a server, and now all the telephones don't work anymore. They work individually, but they don't work because they're not connected. Okay, so hopefully that was clear. So those network analyses, by studying those networks, we can understand more about what's happening in the system, whether it's the human you know, gut, or it's in the plant uh, symbioses, or it's in soil. Understanding those networks, how microbes are connected in a network can tell us something about how the networks function. And so we went out to these areas in Hakalau and asked, you know, two basic questions here was one is like, are they, are, if you're in a restored forest or a non-restored forest, are you like somehow similar to each other? And, you know, the answer is that broadly, yeah, sure. The, as you move those that are near the score means that there's a low value here equals, you know, that they're really similar as you move further away, they get more distance uh, by space, but also their communities are much less similar. And so there is some similarity here by those communities of, you know, native and uh, or restored and remnant forests that are really close together are actually much more common to each other than those that are further away. So there is some sort of distance decay in the relationship that may be related to, again, you know, the influence of planting plus land use history where if you're really close to that boundary, then you're really similar to each other because of the disturbance or because of just space and distributions. Uh, and as you go further away, things change. So that's kind of cool. So at least it showed that there's some sort of distance pattern based in the soil uh, mycorrhizal fungi. And then we wanted to know more about those networks and ask, we asked like, if we took that network and we plotted all the species we found by using some uh, amplicon sequencing, so just looking at the DNA of these guys, uh, what, what might that mean? And so what we found here were there are a couple different species that were really interesting. So these are just identified here. And this is like the remnant forest and restored forest. And what this chart here is basically saying, the node is saying like, how many times is that species connected? So we find this, that these species here are, you know, they're connected a lot. They're, they're in most, you know, nine to 10 connections. So they're, they're just present a lot with lots of uh, connections with other species. And the between the centrality here, remember having a high between the centrality means that you have a high connectivity. So these species were identified as, as virtual uh, keystones in this case. So think of it, the, the microbial keystone analysis is uh, kind of akin to understanding, you know, a, an individual in a network that is, has a low abundance overall, like a sea otter, you don't see a lot of sea otters, but you know that if you took out that sea otter, the ecosystem would be affected because it bridges a whole bunch of really important interactions. And so that's kind of how microbial keystone are viewed. They're viewed as these individuals, the species that are really important in bridging networks that are, you know, may have some sort of ecological function because of their way that they control or work to modify community interactions. And so we looked a little bit closer into this and we asked, uh, you know, we wanted to verify that, that they were actually in really low abundance and you know, sure enough, they are, you can see them down here. So meaning that these species were actually, these important micro, mycorrhizal species were in high ubiquity, they're in lots of samples, but they're very low abundance. So they're not those that are found all over the place, they're not hugely dominant, but they're usually always present and they're present in really low abundances, again, kind of bridging that network. And what's kind of interesting going back a slide here was just that this is one that we found in both habitats. And so we think that this species here has some sort of important role in shaping these networks 
But in the remnant forest, you notice there's also, there were two that identified by our analysis. So it may be that there are more of that functional redundancy of these important microbes in remnant forest as opposed to the restored forest. And this may be an effect of, uh, of the, you know, the centuries of deforestation that have influenced these networks. And so just to kind of, again, here, just, this is the thing we already, we already saw, but it's just showing again that these are species that are identified here, really low abundance. We think they're having an important role. Um, when we made networks of these uh, communities and we looked at the remnant and the restored forest, this is that kind of a similar network to we showed in our example. But, you know, we looked at them and again, this is sort of complicated, but all you have to really think about here is that there are species that are really high connected. And you can see here in these blues this is like the taxonomic group. They're really high connectivity throughout these networks, but there's more of these connections throughout more diverse groups in the remnant forest relative to the, to the restored. And if we remove that, and we took away those in uh, those keystone taxa, we more or less find that the whole network of these microbes, these mycorrhizal fungi in the soils becomes destabilized. More or less, you don't see any of those connections anymore and the networks don't function. And so what we sort of interpret this as is that these, uh, these members are very important, but in the restored forest, the networks are behaving in a slightly different way because of just the different communities that are found inside the, the, the soil. And so kind of taking, uh, you know, taking toll here about what we have found uh, was that the, the soil communities had an effect of restoration. There was a land use effect uh, on the below ground communities. And we take this as, to, as evidence from the, uh, the different mycorrhizal keystone species that we identified. And that these species, although we don't know and experiments need to validate that what their the role might be, but we see that when you have a system that should be the same, and you have different microbial species that are in higher abundance or lower abundance that are shaping networks, it suggests that there's some sort of a difference in how the below ground community is structured, at least as a population or a community. And that's really important for us to consider how are we supposed to facilitate these networks uh, or facilitate the recruitment of species if you have different um, symbiont pools that could you know, lead to different species taking hold um, or helping you know, different plants plant hosts. Um, so, you know, future work on this is really to understand more of this, uh, what the, what's the consequence here? Is it, is it really due to um, some sort of functional redundancy? Are these different keystones doing similar uh, things? What's the impact of them on the community overall? And so that's, you know, work to be done by, by somebody else. Um, and the very last plot here, this is kind of switching over just a, just a little bit, talking about the, the COA, um, as we talked about nitrogen fixation. And I just want, this is a paper that I'm still working on, but uh, I actually just generated this yesterday, but I wanted to throw it in here because I thought it was really interesting. And this is uh, just, you know, think of them as just heat maps. These are, these are called isoscapes, but they're just heat maps that tell us something based on, you know, isotopes and, and samples. And so in this case, I, I know I have a whole presentation that could talk about isotopes, but I just wanted to introduce this one topic here, which I thought was really cool, which was we went out to these forests recently and we did some work to uh, assess the nitrogen content um, inside the soils and sort of acacia coa and some understory plants. What we really found that was interesting was in those restored forests, which is this top panel here, you have nitrogen on this side, carbon on this side. This is the remnant forest here. So um, in this restored forest, we saw that there was overall these much hotter signals of nitrogen fixation throughout the forests. Uh, which we don't see so much here inside the, the restored, or I'm sorry, the remnant forest, which is like the native one that was never deforested. So what's really interesting there is that it seems that there's this pattern of higher densities of COA, more nitrogen fixation in the restored forest. You don't see that pattern inside the remnant forest really at all. So this, we see that the, the restored forest has a greater signature of more fixation, more nitrogen made available to the community of plants inside that forest. And then when we look at the carbon side of it, we just see it actually is much cooler. In this case, the isotopes here suggest that this is much more of a grass dominated habitat through this area. And yeah, so what's really interesting there is that in the remnant forest, you just don't see that same pattern. And so what is the takeaway from this? Ultimately, we hope the reviewers are favorable of our interpretation, which is that the restored forest seem to show again, this, this below ground community effect where not just that the mycorrhizal fungi appear to be sort of different, forming different community networks, but also that the function of those engineers with their symbiotic bacteria are also affecting the forest by providing more nitrogen, which can then affect, you know, 
you know, the chemistry of the soil plus the ability for different plants to grow. And we see that as facilitating these invasive grasses through the signature of the carbon that's throughout this area. So really interesting work forthcoming. I don't know, we'll see. Uh, but it's very interesting to think about how restoration has affected these above and below ground services and sort of what that impact of restoration land use history in you know, really half a decade. Um, and so ultimately, you know, take away from this one slide here is just that we think that acacia coa is affecting the nutrient cycling because it's in such high densities and ultimately it's facilitating the grass understory to be dominant and maybe hurting the recruitment of native species. So just final take homes here, um, restoring tropical ecosystems, restoring any ecosystem is hard. And while we need to take action now to address some of these problems, you also need to have a long term, long game approach. And that includes, you know, addressing the causes of the problem, which may be nutrient pollution or maybe the, you know, having ungulates, you know, roam free and then restoring and mitigating those changes. You know, so maybe that's increasing the percent cover of, a, of an important ecosystem engineer or you know, putting back uh, important species like herbivores that are going to you know, help keep a system in a stable state or, you know, engineer that resilience for that system. Um, and this needs to be really evaluated over decades. You know, the impact of the first story we talked about on coral reefs, I mean, that was a really cool, it was great to see, everyone was really happy. It was, you know, cost millions of dollars. But what, what, mean, what, what might this mean for the next 10 to 20 years? If the state says, great job, we've now mitigated all the invasive algae and they walk away, would it come back in five years? Would it come back because there's still the conditions present there for it to explode? which such maybe like low herbivore biomass or things like this. And there's also other areas across the island that are facing the same problem that maybe aren't inside Kaneohe Bay. So there's, then those can then also act as like pools to recruit into Kaneohe and then start the whole cycle all over again. So it's a, it's a really, it's a long-term approach. And in the case of, uh, of Hakalau, you know, those short-term successes where they were able to grow, you know, hundreds of thousands of trees have provided, you know, habitat for native birds, but, there's these below ground influences on nitrogen cycling and the symbiotic pools that we're really still not sure are, what those consequences might be. And I think that, you know, taking a step back and, you know, thinking about restoration in the context of the short term and the long term is really important. And it's something we see more of now, but uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of problems. There's a lot of habitat that needs to be restored and lots of species that are charismatic and some that are not, that need to be um, you know, conserved and hopefully, uh, studies like this will contribute to that long-term goal of restoring tropical habitats and native uh, ecosystem engineers. And with that, babies, those are my kids. Uh, so, and I wanna thank uh, Pacific Biosciences and uh, Hawaii Division of Aquatic Resources for funding me on these works. And if you have any questions, papers, wanna talk, uh, feel free to hit me up. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Very nicely done. Thank you. Thank you. That, was a, that was a stretch. I know I was trying to bring in everything I could think of that was, you know, the ocean, because everyone likes corals. And then I was like, oh, but I talk about trees and stuff too. And so I was trying to hit it all. So hopefully you guys uh, were captivated. That was amazing. That was great, man. Awesome, awesome job. I know that, um, last, that last figure was really intriguing. I'm, I'm, you can't scroll back. You're not sharing your screen. But I no, Brenton, I interrupted you. I'm so sorry. I was no, go for it. The, the, no. I was just gonna say this is time for questions. If anyone okay. has, go for it. I don't know if my brain's been on all day. I don't know what the what the issue is, but so essentially, your studies are just going to further contribute to you know deciding whether or not there's a need for restoration. So I mean, essentially, if someone were to actually look at this and say, okay, yes, the nitrogen fixation, like the uneven distribution, it's caused by this restoration, which they obviously thought was beneficial, but it's not. Would that mean like pulling up these trees or just finding a new way to integrate more variety? I don't know. Like, yeah, I can't even. Yeah. Write no, it's, it's, it's a good, I mean, yeah, it's, it's like a, it's a quagmire. Uh, and I think that when this paper eventually does get reviewed and hopefully it gets published, I think it's going to make a bunch of people feel like, damn it. What okay, we... so what do we do? <laughs> you know, and so I think that that's a, that's a, I mean, yeah, it's a real world problem. Uh, what do we do? Um, and I don't, you know, and it's not to say that those koa trees are somehow like destroying the forest. It's just that they planted 300,000 of them in giant rows down a mountain. Mm -hmm. And 
that ultimately what they could do and they've tried to do is by doing more, more planting and seeding and of other species. But there's a reason why they chose koa. Koa grows super fast. They wanted to have dividends. They want to see the trees. Other native species do not grow as fast. They don't produce the nitrogen. Yohia, for example, is a fantastic, beautiful tree. I think if you put side by side next to koa, you'd say, oh, he is definitely more beautiful. But it's also, in case you hadn't heard, um, has been a, it's been uh, suffering from a fungal blight. Uh, it has a fungal disease that's been uh, rampant across the islands and huge swaths of forest have disappeared because this one species is affected by some fungal pathogen. They don't know where it came from. They think maybe it came in from garden soil somewhere, but it's spread across the islands and they've you know, tried to quarantine it off, but it's a real problem. This is the, o the only other canopy forming native species and it is now literally just rapidly dying. The, the disease is called rapid ohia death because it just dies. And, you know, so they've created a forest. They need to think of ways to add more uh, native plants and then potentially, yeah, maybe down the line, there is a need to thin some of the trees because they produce tons of seeds too. You don't notice, but on that main tract of all the planted trees, if you go just to the right and left of it, where like the corridors are starting to merge, there are thousands, there probably are another like million, 10 million trees that are all the small babies now that are growing. So, and actually in co especially, the nitrogen fixation actually is faster when they're smaller and it slows when they get older in life. Yeah. So it may be the need to really mitigate how many seeds are recruiting in these corridors because those are probably contributing just as much as these older trees are. So it's complicated, but sometimes it's just understanding what these impacts might be, you know, Restoration is hard. If you were trying to build an ecosystem, how would you do it? Over millennia? <laughs> you know, like, it's not simple. So I, I think that there's a monetary, the monetary issue here too, right? It, the state doesn't have $10 million to just throw at a project and hope it works out. You have to show that it's going to work and that someone's going to get reelected for it, right? And so it's, it, it's, it's tricky, but I think that monitoring and keeping an eye on these things is the goal. That's the key, you know, understanding mm -hmm. what these impacts might be, shifting baselines, all of that. That's what's really important. Um, not just walking away, which is also what happens a lot of the time. Yeah, because it's challenging. I mean, it's, yeah, that is super, super interesting though. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for your interest. I'm curious to know like what got you started in this and like how old were you and why? Um, once I was a bright eyed young man thinking about a career in science. Um, no, I really for coral reefs, like that was like Britain maybe mentioned or not, I'm not sure, but I grew up in Texas. So I- Oh yeah, I, did, I didn't mention that fun fact either. Yeah, yeah, I know, right? I mean, like, I don't really talk about it, but, uh, <laughs> but I, yeah, I grew up in Texas and I, you know, I loved coral reefs and that's what I really wanted to study because uh, I was concerned about them for climate change and all these kind of things. and. I wanted to study them and I did my master's and PhD studying coral reefs. And, but when I was in Texas, actually my, uh, my path to like getting into grad school was I needed to get some undergrad experience. And I uh, worked in a lab that did mycorrhizal fungi, physiological ecology with wetland plants. So symbiosis, uh, plants sounded cool. Did some experiments, learned a bunch of things, published a paper, went to grad school, studied coral reefs. And then I was, looking for a job and I applied to a lab here because when you finish your, your degree, you're looking for a job. And I applied to a lab that did mycorrhizal fungal ecology and plants. And I was like, well, I have experience with that. And, you know, 10 years of studying symbioses in Hawaii in the ocean and stable isotopes and molecular work. And they're like, cool, let's just, let's do that on land. <laughs> and so, and that, so it worked out, but you know, never think that a skill you learn isn't a skill you can apply. So I would recommend always thinking about your five-year plan, but don't wait five years to start planning, you know. Thank you. You're so yeah. fascinated. I love it. It's amazing. I appreciate you for sharing. Yeah, yeah. I used to also sing in a metal band. That would, didn't really work out the same way, but. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. Well, if this doesn't I'll, work, you have a backup plan. You got a backup worry. plan, yeah. I'm always, I'm always like, you know, got some, someone on the side going. Maybe I'll show them a video or two. Next. No video. <laughs> <laughs> I've already denigrated myself enough for one talk. Um, so in between the forest kind of work you've done and then the coral reef 
work you've done too, have you noticed there's a financial difference between them? Like how much money you get for each project? Is there more money allocated to one versus the other? Um, personally, I'd say that we use a lot more money to study coral reefs mm -hmm. as like smaller scale. Like we'll try to do some studies, but it's hard because we, we're not, you know, we're not able to be underwater for a long time. So maybe it's more expensive to do some of the things on corals. Um, restoration on the ocean is actually quite hard because, you know, whether it's boats or it's scuba or it's culturing organisms, you can, anyone can have a greenhouse, but it is a very hard task to start growing mariculture, you know, and then if you wanted to do work on in a forest, I think that it's a lot easier for someone to understand the problems like, hey, there's no trees here. We should put trees there. And, so, you know, okay, cool. I can hire someone to plant trees. But to say, I'm going to start a coral garden and then restore this reef with coral. I mean, it already sounds hard. And it, it's, I think that there's a lot of money that goes into forest, um, the forest because of the uh, endangered species that we're very familiar with. But a lot of times on coral reefs, I think a lot more, more of the money goes towards fish biomass because people like fishing, um, or at least in a way to facilitate fishing or talking about like we got to conserve fishes, but then you have a lot of strife. I think on, you have this fishermen and the farmers or fishermen and the, and the cattlemen, you know, that they're both like, well, you don't, you won't, you don't want me to have, you know, grasslands, but you want to order, you know, a burger from in and out or you don't want me to fish, but you're more than happy going out to eat for dinner and ordering fish on your menu. So there's this sort of, you know, you always have a battle with someone who's using those resources. Um, but in reality, there's much more forest land than there is coral reef habitat. So that's a little bit of a difference there too, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Have you ever like scuba dived down and like saw everything firsthand? Yeah, I'm a, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got to scuba dive. I mean, I mean, you don't have to. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, scuba diving is great. It's, it's uh, yeah. Um, He's I a true scientist. He spends just as much time in the lab, maybe even more time in the lab, but out in the field. But he actually does go out into the field and, and does real things. Real, I mean, real I experiments. Pre-COVID, I guess, in you know, in the before times, things <laughs> I used to go outside and do things. Um, yeah, but the uh, yeah, I mean, scuba is is great it's a tool. You don't necessarily need it for every case. Britain will tell you that sometimes you, your best friend is just holding your breath. You know, you don't have to do as much red tape. I mean, just have someone to spot you and make sure you don't black out. <laughs> but I, I did several parts of my PhD where I was just free diving um, because it was just faster, more efficient, but scuba is something that's really, you know, it's useful for the right tool. It's the right, right method. Have you been able to like scuba dive around the world? Sure. Yeah. Things in like Hawaii. Yeah, um, I actually was, you know, on the topic of scuba, I did get a chance to go on a, one of a, a NOAA research crews that went up to the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument, which is the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Uh, so it's one of the largest national, largest marine protected areas in the world. And I got to go up there and do some diving. And that was pretty incredible. You know, fish as big as you just swimming around you in like tornado kind of stuff. It was, it was incredible. But I haven't had a chance to do too much diving as of late because I have a you know like kids and stuff. It's hard. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yes, no. Yeah, I got so so. Thanks, great talk. Thanks, dude. This is great. Um, I think one of the most disturbing trends that I've seen in the last couple of years isn't so much the fascination with if you build it, they will come, but it's this really disturbing to me as a restoration call it a disturbing trend where people want to talk about passive restoration and sometimes they call it natural restoration and um so right now one of my committees that i sit on there's a large push from a, a political contingent to um in this case a coastal wetland a biona wetlands in la to basically say we should not be restoring them or, 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 or let me say that differently. We should not be doing any active bulldozing or active manipulation. It's just, it's unnatural. And, and I'm seeing this more and more, these, these people that um, don't understand that, you know, how perturbed these systems are. And that in many cases, we do need some intense interventions. Um, but I, I saw it originally coming from 
corporate America. So a lot of oil spill folks and everybody was like, oh, no, dude, passive restoration is the way to go because they wouldn't have to spend as much money and, and that kind of stuff. But it really seems to have glommed on in different in different areas. And I'm just curious as to in Hawaii, if you've seen that sort of notion of, oh, man, all this all this manipulation, these are all colonial ideas and you know corporate idea, that kind of thing have you seen much of that that notion um in these systems you know it's funny you say that because um well when i was doing stuff in texas i was doing a lot of wetland restoration work too and that's you're, you're totally right you know someone builds a wetland and says it's wet it's on land that's it did it and it, that's not at all the case it's sometimes it's just they don't want to spend the time monitoring uh, you know, the decades it might take to monitor. Um, and, you know, in Hawaii, they've actually done some pretty, I, I had some pretty revolutionary things with thinking about large scale restoration in the context of sort of decolonization or like in culture. Um, for instance, uh, a lot of places um, in the world, you said you, you bulldoze mangroves, they'd be like, oh my God, why? Well, that's terrible. Don't, what, mangroves are important, but not in Hawaii, actually. Hawaii, mangroves never were supposed to be here and so they actually trap a bunch of sediment but they don't they don't provide the habitat for the fishes in the coastal areas and so they've been trying to pull out a whole bunch of mangroves uh to um to kind of restore coastlines and their whole thing was you know and some of these areas around fish ponds have been completely overgrown with mangroves and so they're saying well what we need to do is we need to if we can rebuild the streams and get rid of the channelized streams and all the concrete and then we can plant farms upstream and we can pull out the mangroves downstream, we'll re return to a natural nutrient system that it's supposed to be like, and that would be much better than just having these engineers that are here that aren't really supposed to, they're doing some sort of strange, you know, you know, strange sort of process, you know, whether it's trapping nutrients or you know, providing habitat for weird microbes. And so they've, they've been doing that a lot. Um, and I think that some of it comes back to like the, if the community wants it, the people that are in the neighborhood say, you know what we should do? We need to tear out these like 10 acres of, of, of mangroves and rebuild the fish pond the way it was so that we can actually have fish growing here because there's no fish in this pond. It's full of mangroves. That I think is much more uh, fruitful when you have that sort of, you know, that connection to someone who cares for the land nearby. And, and you're totally right. It's corporate America. They very rarely do they care. And then if it's a state issue, you're talking about, money they're like well how much do i have to pay you to restore this thing to this pond behind a walmart how much money is this going to take and, and and it's this you know it takes investment but you have it takes accountability too i think that's the main thing and that's what's really hard um in all these cases it's just having someone that's going to be accountable for it long term i have a question that I, i'm glad you asked that sean i didn't know you were on the bio biona wetlands committee that we should chat about that um but um i had a similar question because we have quite a few restoration efforts planned in california for various smaller seasonally closed wetlands right where like tidewater gobies are found and you know the one the one that happened most recently was was malibu in malibu they they didn't really take into account any type of native like they did native habitat but as much as much more about like water conservation and stuff like that but we don't really have any remnant lagoons to actually use as a baseline for a restoration effort we actually do have two of them but nobody has actually done a long-term study to understand them to actually use them as a resource and they're up on Vandenberg Air Force Base so all the the you know kind of projects that they outlined for Malibu were all from like South Africa and Australia, right? Um, how, how, what do you think the difference is? Like, I, I'm assuming in Hawaii, these, these montane forests that you're using as remnant are actually truly remnant, you know, yeah. right? So yeah, they're, they're, no, they haven't been deforested. Right. So, I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to think of how much easier or even maybe it's more difficult for you guys to do restoration efforts because you actually have true remnant forest to use as a baseline where we're doing all these restoration efforts on our coast of dunes, of lagoons, all this stuff. And 
nobody we don't have remnant and you know habitats to actually use as a baseline but everyone is just you know one might be pushed by backers that just want better water quality one might be used on like it might be a steelhead habitat or you know something like that so i'm just trying to you know i'm thinking about the differences that it is just with what you have to deal with restoration wise because you have that that great resource as of a remnant population to to use as a baseline yeah, I think it definitely helps when you have something that you can measure or a like historical record or something like that you can you can compare to. I think it might also, like you were maybe alluding to, make it more difficult to see the dividends that you want because you say, well, why haven't you recreated the remnant? Why is it not like the remnant? Uh, it's like comparing it yourself to a sibling or something. And and I think that ultimately you're, you're right that it's it's almost impossible it might truly be impossible to create a habitat that is exactly like another that has been disturbed for a century. Yep. And it may be that, yeah, you could restore it. Um, you could plant some things and then hope that secession works the way it should. But, you know, there's a problem also with our view of what a forest or what you know wetland might look like because you know, for a great example, let's think about Hawaii. Hawaii, uh, you know, generally formed by shield volcanoes. You have, where are the most important nitrogen fixers on lava where you have, or you know, on, on, you know, newly formed rock where you have plants you know, recruiting to over a hundred thousand years, there's cyanobacteria. Okay, so how do you go from a, a, a rock, no soil, where Ohia recruits to, by the way, and then grows there, eventually creating a forest over millennia. And then ultimately you start seeing koa pop up and all these other species that have naturally gone through this arc of secession from early pioneering to you know, beginning established to you know, young, mature, all that. We're looking at the apex yeah. that you know, wh whatever you think about Joe O'Connell, you know, you know, where are we on this curve? You know, like, and you say, okay, well, if it, is it, how disturbed is it? Which part of, where are we, you know? I, you know, like, I don't know, how can you create a mature forest starting with a grassland that hasn't seen a mature forest that would take a thousand years, but you want it in 30. So it's like all these questions. I mean, maybe it's completely not even a, a thing, but what we might care about, again, in this case, are we care about the, the engineers. We care about planting trees, therefore it is a forest. It may be that that is the low bar we set for ourselves. As long as we can see it suck up carbon and, you know, keep the soil from eroding away and provide habitat for essential species that we find to be important. I mean, we're losing the fight to save biodiversity globally. So, you know, are we going, going to throw in the towel and say, well, we can't make it perfect and give up. I don't think that's the way either, of course, but there, there's got to be a way to create the services and the ecosystem that can then provide that habitat for recruitment. Whether it's like you want tie water gobies to recruit, you need water. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like you gotta start somewhere. You gotta have water and some habitat. But also, and, you know, it's like it's the, it, like what we've been pushing too. It's it's not only do they need water, but they need this this really, you know, it, it's called rupia. It's this it's this freshwater widging grass which never showed up in in the the restoration plan. What happens with the rupee? It actually brings in all these really small microinvertebrates that the Taiwan go beats that nobody's talking about because nobody's actually, you know, thought about this on kind of a larger trophic scale like you're talking about. Yeah. It's like let's let's open it up so we can get steelhead in there and then it's a restoration, you know? Yeah. And it's like you need someone to do a network analysis, is what you're saying, is yes, what I'm hearing. Yes. Right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's just put it, put it on the network. I got a project for us once you get back to California. Sounds good. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I can do it. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. I got one I was, more just to, just to be oh, a, a pain in the butt. But um, so there's companies that have been coming up in the last couple of years to create these little mycorrhizal pellets, right, to inoculate soils. And um, initially I thought, oh, these are, this is great, right? This, this will help us jumpstart, say, this grassland restoration or this, this you know, community to help that subsurface uh, soil community get going. But 
the more research I see like yours and other people's, it, it, it always talks about the, the massive diversity of these fungal communities. And I worry a little bit, it's sort of like plant, should we plant a koa tree or should we plant like 30 trees? And I get it that it's probably better than not doing anything, but I worry a little bit about which, which fungi we're picking to be the, the inoculators. I wonder, yeah, I was going to yeah. kind of ask that. I was like, are you picking, are, are people picking that, that keystone mycorrhizal fund that you were talking about in inoculating it? Or are they doing like, like my probiotic pill that I take that has like 10 million, whatever. And are they throwing those out? Like, what's the best way to do it? Well, you know what, what I would say, and you know, I'm not, I'm, I haven't done any work with the, you know, forced inoculation like that. Um, but you know, I would say that ultimately, if you are trying to establish plants in an area and you want to start them off by inoculating them, like usually you're talking about greenhouse work, you're trying to say like, in the greenhouse, we're going to grow them. And then we're gonna take the strongest ones and put them out in the field. What you ideally would like to do is to either take donor soil from the place that you think is representative, uh, whether that's a remnant forest, or it's just where you're going to plant them, and let them inoculate and form those interactions with the mycorrhizae that are already in the soil, right? Because you can make you know, the mycorrhizal pellets and you can get mycorrhizal inoculated soil already, right? They just sell them. And it's probably, you know, I don't know if it's from a, a, a culture, it might be like the glomus is uh, like a really common species. And maybe that's the one that's just commonly put in stuff. Um, but I think the more we understand about how this functional diversity works in symbiont communities across, whether it's coral symbionts or mycorrhizal symbionts, it's important to at least if you're going to put someone or put a plant somewhere you want to use the community that you're hoping to establish with it right that may be the microbes um or it may be something else and i think that that's that's generally how you'd want to, to think about like any kind of microbiome or symbiotic system right you want it to work the way that it's designed in nature to work you might have some that do great that are kind of like you know going to hype everything up and make it grow really fast and do fantastic work but you know maybe they don't handle heat as well they don't handle water saturation as well or it's just not one that's found in that 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 latitude you know and, and that's something that i think we, we don't want to start then you know putting out you know more invasive species but you know in in, in truth it's it's a it's a tough one because uh you know mycorrhizae are also spread quite easily so i think a part of people are just kind of like ah whatever it's 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 everywhere all the time just put put something in the pot but I do think that more of a natural approach is to take from a donor that you're going to put the plant in. I have a question. Yeah. Um, is your work uh, published somewhere that we could access it? Yeah. Um, my website has links to all my stuff. Um, it's pretty easy to remember. It's Coral Oha. So it's like Coral Oha. So coral oha I, I have it. I have it right here. I'll I'll put it in the chat for everybody. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, so you can uh, access all of. If you go like to the CV tab on there, it has uh, links to ResearchGate for all these papers, more or less. And if there's one that's not on there, and you just are curious about something, um, hit me up, and I'd be happy to send it to you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. It was a great time talking about oceans and forests and awesome. Thanks, dude. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my right. friend. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll stick around for a few minutes if anyone has any other questions or needs to chat. But other than that, thank you everyone for attending. And we'll see you in two weeks for our next talk.